Amen. Certainly as beautiful as me. And we are going to see not only his beauty today, but possibly your own. Sermon is titled today, Take a Look at Yourself. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And we're going to be in verses 9 through 27 today. Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 27. Where we are at now in the book of Revelation, as we're almost to the end, is we have seen the coming of the judgment of God that's going to pour out upon the earth. We have seen how the church is going to be persecuted in the days ahead and all the problems that we will face. And now we are seeing that one day Jesus is going to come, put an end to this all, rule on this earth, and bring in a kingdom of everlasting righteousness. And before he sort of bids us away uh, through this book to go back into the world, he wants us to see here something very, very special. Something that you won't find in the world but you will find in him. Let's take a look here at Revelation 21. And let's look here at verse 9. The Apostle John writes, Then one of the seven angels, who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came and spoke to me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He then carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like a very precious stone, like a jasper stone, bright as crystal. The city had a massive high wall with twelve gates. Twelve angels were at the gates, and on the gates names were inscribed, the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. The city wall had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the Lamb's twelve apostles. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with the rod at twelve thousand stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits according to human measurement, which the angel used. The building material of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation, jasper, the second, sapphire, the third, chalcedony, the fourth, emerald, Sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The broad street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I did not see a sanctuary in it because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk in its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will never close because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it and nothing profane will ever enter it. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we all need to hear your word this morning. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us understanding that you would not only teach us the wonderful truth contained within these verses and reveal them to our hearts, but also that you would truly transform our lives by it. <coughs> that we, Lord, would see what you are making us to be. And that we, Lord, would realize that no matter how we view ourselves or how the world views us, this is how you view we who are born again through your blood and your spirit. 
I pray, Father, now that if there's any here whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you would ink them in that book today by your blood as they come to you by faith and give their lives to following you. And strengthen we your people that we would go forth strongly in the faith upon hearing your word to us today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. When we look into the mirrors of this life, we don't always like what we see. Some of us look into those mirrors and we find that we're too tall. Others look into those mirrors and we say we're too short. Some of us look into those mirrors and we say we're too fat. And some of us look into those mirrors and say we're too skinny. Some people look into those mirrors and say we've got too many freckles. Other people look into those mirrors and say we've got too many wrinkles. Some look into those mirrors and say... We don't have enough hair. Others of us look and say we've got plenty of hair. It's just in the wrong place. Some things are very out of proportion for us when we look into the mirrors of this life. And that's just on the outside. When we look into the mirrors of our hearts and souls, we might find that we are not as patient and loving and kind and forgiving as we ought to be. And that there is entirely too much sin within us for there should be much more righteousness. Maybe we fit into the category James spoke of saying, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he is like a man who intently looks at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away, and at once he forgets what he was like. Ever experienced that? I have. Far too many times. I think we may have all been the man in the mirror there in our lives. And even the church itself has a mirror that the world puts up for us to look in. And that mirror tells us that the church is anemic and weak. We are small-minded and bigoted. We need to be done away with so that a new order can come in to society where we pesky Christians aren't messing with it all the time. In that mirror, the promise of God that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church looks lost. And that will never appear to be more the case than in the last days to which we are going. All of these mirrors, friends, tell us one thing. We are ugly. But these mirrors don't tell the whole story. These mirrors don't tell us how God views us. This isn't God putting a mirror before us and saying, look at what you are in my sight. These are mirrors that distort who we really are. But God is putting a mirror before us today. And if you look intently into that mirror by faith, and you are truly born again of Christ in this world, you are going to find, friend, that you are far more victorious and you are far more beautiful, and you are far more handsome, and far more righteous than you'd ever imagine yourself to be. His mirror is the only one that matters, and what we see in it is what Christ is making us and has made us to be. He wants us to look in this mirror today and see that He is shaping us and holding us into something incredible, a bride fit for God himself, adorned in all of her beauty. Now this comes to us today through the Apostle John. He is receiving here a message and he says, The angel that had the seven last plagues came to me and told me this. He said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed in God's glory. Now that is interesting. This angel says, come here, John. I want to show you something here. I want to show you the bride of the Lamb, the wife of the Lamb. And John comes, and this angel shows him this city. The implication here, if you haven't already put it together, is that when John is looking at this city and seeing its description and understanding how it's beautifully adorned and arrayed, what the angel is showing John is actually describing the church. 
It's describing you and I. It's describing we who love and believe in Jesus. This is our beauty from God. This new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. The splendor and majesty and glory that you're going to hear described in just a moment. This is you. This is how God actually views you. This is not how the world views you. This is not even how you yourself view you. Listen, friend, I'm going to be very honest with you. I come to this pulpit today feeling completely unworthy to be here. I come to this pulpit thinking they deserve any other man to preach this morning but me. That's looking at myself in the mirror. But I'm looking here, and you're looking here, at our reflection by what Jesus is making us to be. We are the church that he has purchased with his blood, purified by his spirit, preserved for salvation by his power, and perfected by being raised as he was raised. So open your eyes and look into this mirror and take a good look at yourself here as we see first that he has made us. When John sees this heavenly city, he says that it was coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed in God's glory. Her radiance was like a very precious stone, like a jasper stone, bright as crystal. This beautiful city, the bride of Jesus Christ, comes from God. It comes from God's heaven. It is arrayed in God's glory. So, so that you don't miss the point here, friend, this is no achievement of man. This is all of God. In heaven, no one will be foolish enough to believe that man had anything to do with this salvation whatsoever. We only entertain that thought here. I can promise you, when we are here, being this city, everybody will know this is of God. The bride of Jesus. The city of Jesus. Those who have been saved in Jesus are saved only by the gift of God's grace and cleansed in Christ's blood. It is He who took me dead lumps of clay, we valley of dead, dry bones, and washed us in His redeeming blood and breathed into us the breath of life, that we would be born again through His Spirit. It is He and He alone that has arrayed us and dressed us in His glory. Oh, friend, I pray that there's enough spiritual work in you this morning that you see when you look into the mirror of your self-sufficiency, you'll see yourself covered there in ugliness and warts and moles and scars. And those are all honestly earned by us. But look into this mirror from God. And you'll see the sufficiency of Jesus and Jesus alone. And then you'll see yourself beautifully and wonderfully made and saved. For He has made you to be such in His sight. This is the truth of the gospel that has saved our souls. And made us new, brothers and sisters. It is that faith handed down to the saints once and for all. As the Bible says in Ephesians 2, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. And did you notice here that this city, John saw, he said, oh, look at that city, and the city had foundations and it had gates. It had 12 foundations and it had 12 Gates And the twelve foundations carried the names of the twelve apostles. And the twelve gates carried the names of the heads of the houses of the tribes of Israel. This means, brothers and sisters, that believers in the Lord Jesus all across the ages and all across the, the nations are here in this city. We are all the bride of Christ. Nobody is left out. That's right. And while we can assume... That many more have rejected Jesus than received him. I mean, he said that would happen. That many more have taken the broad way that leads to hell instead of the narrow way that leads to life through Jesus. All the same, God has saved a lot of people. John says that this city was 12,000 stadia. That is about 1,500 miles wide. And he said this city is cubed, so it's 1,500 miles wide wide, 1,500 miles long, and 1,500 miles tall. 
And I know what y'all are thinking. You're, you're hearing that in your life. Mm. We all going to have room in that city together. I mean, some of us like the country pretty good, and that might get a little tight there. Well, somebody a whole lot smarter than me, one mathematician, kind of calculated all of this one day, and he calculated that that city could fit 100 billion people in it. Now, that's, that's way far more than probably actually saved, and he, he assigned the acres. I think we all got 30 acres or something like that. So can everybody deal with that? Are we cool with this? Okay. So we're all good there. And all of this, the main thing here is it comes from God. It comes from the church. It comes uh, from the church he has made and glorified and beautified by his blood, his death, and resurrection. Now, let's look here also to see, secondly, that he has bought us and brought us to himself. Look at what is written in verse 21. That verse says, The twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The, the broad street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. It, and I did not see a sanctuary in it, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. Brothers and sisters, I absolutely love this. I pray that if I convey nothing else to you today, that you'll, you'll really get this. John talks about here the pearly gates. And he says in this city, there's 12 gates. There's four sides of this city. Each side has three gates. And he said all of these gates are pearl. Big pearls. You know, pearls are tiny. These are gates big enough that we can walk through. And he said all of these sides had these pearly gates. Now, we've all talked about the pearly gates of heaven, right? Everybody's heard that. Everybody said, oh, yeah, I see Peter's right there on the other side with the blah, blah, No, none of that. None of that nonsense. But we do have gates of pearl. But have you ever really thought about what that means? The pearly gate? You know how a pearl is made? A pearl is made when the humble oyster is wounded in his flesh. He gets a tear. Something gets in there and messes him up. And he pours out this liquid pearl, I guess you could call it, to, to fill in the wound and to create healing. And that pearl hardens. And that's what we take from it. That's the pearl we get. But it all starts because this oyster was harmed. All other gems, all other precious items like that are metal or their stone, but not the pearl. The pearl is the only one that is made by living flesh. It's the only precious gem made by living flesh. And it calls us to understand here that we come in and we have our freedom in heaven for one reason and one reason only. And that is because Jesus gave up his flesh for us. It is our sins that God put upon him. If you ever question, friend, the, the wickedness or sin or evil that resides in your hearts, just look to the back of Jesus being ripped apart for you. Look to the hands and feet of Jesus being pierced and driven with nails into them to hang him on a cross. Look to the blood and water that poured out from his side as the Romans stabbed his heart. But in all amazing grace, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. Jesus himself said, this is my body broken for you. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And those city gates are an eternal reminder to every body that ever there and everybody that has their freedom there that we are there because the Lamb of God gave up his body gave up his blood gave up his life for us on the old rugged cross he is glorious isn't he he is a true heavenly pearl when you look into that mirror of God you need to see there that God gave his body and blood for you personally that you would be saved from his wrath and eternally know the blessings of life 
in him. And that great sacrifice that he made brings us into a right standing with God. And if you look in that mirror again, you'll see that that right standing brings you to commune with Jesus face to face. For this reason, John said, I did not see a sanctuary in this city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its sanctuary. We don't need to go somewhere to worship Jesus then. We don't need to, to enter some tabernacle or temple or sanctuary. Get into the Holy of Holies to see God face to face. He walks among us. He is among us. He is himself the sanctuary. Reminds me of that great old hymn, face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face how will it will be when in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all of his glory I shall see him by and by. When Jesus is before us, we have no need of a temple because He is the temple and we are with Him. And all of life then, you see, all of life, Jesus has perfected you, beautified you, glorified you to the point that you can dwell with Him face to face. And all of eternity will be one solid praise service to God. I hope you're okay with that. I read this last week. Some very confusing and disturbing things, to me anyway, about the church. One of the trends that they say the church is going to have to get on board with this year is we're going to have to just deal with the fact that people that are plugged into the church, regular attenders in the church, what we used to consider regular attendance is going to be cut dramatically. Like right now we might say, oh, if you come four times a, a month, you are, you, you know, you're a regular attender. The trend now they're saying is if you come once a month, we'll count that as regular attendance. And they, they say all these reasons for this happening, you know, uh, life is too fast. Sports on Sunday. And, uh, everybody's got more money now. You know, middle class, class is shrinking, but the upper class is getting bigger. So everybody's got more cash. They're so running around doing stuff and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just looking at there and I'm thinking, you still don't get around from Scripture like you don't forsake the assembling together of yourselves like others do. And you do that all the more as you see the day come. It's very easy to see how the great falling away is taking shape. God told us in his word. And I just, when I think about this, I, I wonder if everybody even here is okay with this. Are you okay with literally being in an eternal worship service to God? There, there's no, there, you know, there's no, we're taking a break today, Lord, family time. There's none of that. We are worshiping him always. Praising and exalting Jesus. Filled with his glory. Giving him endless, ceaseless praise. Don't let this world or your mind deceive you, friend. Don't be like that, that crane. That one day a swan came up and talked to the crane. And the swan said, I want to talk to you today about heaven. And... And the swan said, oh, it is the most beautiful place you can imagine. It is the place where God dwells with his people. It is the place where the streets are gold. And it's the place where we're all praising Jesus. And it is just so wonderful and so amazing. And, and I so want you to go there. And the crane asked, are there snails in heaven? And the swan said, snails? Of course there's no snails in heaven. And the crane said, well, you can have heaven. I want snails. And he went back to poking his nose in the mud trying to get snails. A lot of people are kind of in that situation. It's too hard to look up because you know 
Your life is going to have to dramatically change. So what do we do? We keep our noses to the earth. Be careful of doing that. Don't be satisfied with mere snails. When Christ has died and rose again to offer you eternal life, He will array you, He will dress you in His righteousness and glory that you might glorify Him forever. And you can add to it here that He is our light. Look at verse 23. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk in its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will never close because it will never be night there. We find here that the bride of Christ, the wife of the Lamb, always walks and always lives in the shining glory of God. In heaven, we'll need no sun or no moon. We need no lights because God himself is our light. And in Him is no darkness at all. Our very skin will glisten with the presence of His glory. And we shall be like the moon reflecting the sun as He shines. And we reflect His light to continually give Him glory upon glory. Listen to how God put this in Isaiah 24. He said the moon itself will be put to shame and the sun disgrace because the Lord of hosts will reign as king on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and he will display his glory in the presence of his elders. One Bible commentator says of Christ's glory that this is the uncreated light of him who is light, dispensed by and through the Lamb as the everlasting lamp to the home and to the hearts and understandings of his glorified saints. Moses saw this glory when he spent time with God on top of Mount Sinai. And it literally made him blow to the point that all the other people of Israel were terrified of him. Paul saw this glorious light and gave his life up to follow Jesus in seeing it. And we too shall shine from His presence and we shall be changed. We shall bring all of our treasures and lay them at last at His feet. And we will be navigating all of life perfectly fine because His light will never, never dim. It doesn't matter in heaven if you are a king or a slave on earth. In the new world, there will be no distinctions among men like there is now. Everyone is there by the Lamb. Everyone is there to glorify the Lamb. And everyone walks in the light, which is Christ Jesus. And now, we see lastly, that He is our life. Look at this in verse 27. John writes, Nothing profane will ever enter into it. No one who does what is vile or false but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Yeah. What a promise. And what a look he is able to see. That if your name is inked in that Lamb's book of life by faith in Him, then you are forever a citizen of this city. And if you are not a citizen, if your name is not written in this Lamb's book of life, then He gives you this very day to turn from your sin and turn to Him by faith and follow Him. By doing so, His blood will write your name in that book and forever your life will be bound in Him. And when those books are open in the last day, you will be ever so thankful to hear your name called out of this book and not the book in which the world will be condemned. And if you do so, friend, I tell you, it will absolutely change you. And if your name is written in that book, maybe you need to be reminded today of how this should change you now. You know, a couple of years back, I was heavily involved, almost, I guess you could say, to an idolatrous level in competitive shooting. I traveled all over this great country of ours, everywhere from Tulsa, Oklahoma, to Springfield, Massachusetts, shooting matches. And I've got to tell you, with the exception of only a few states, I never really felt comfortable traveling uh, through most of the states with a gun. Most states had laws that were vague and they were designed.
I am, quite frankly, to put me in the crosshairs of transgression. And I was always happy when I would cross state lines back into Indiana because that was home. Their laws designed more for freedom than for tyranny. I was a citizen there, and those laws served to protect me. And the longer I am in Christ, friend, I get that same uneasy feeling that I felt going through states with terrible laws just living in this world. I'm not made for this place. I know I'm not home yet. And you in Christ aren't either. I know that what I am today is not what I'm going to be then. A great philosopher by the name of C.S. Lewis once said that if I find myself having desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And we are. If you are truly a believer in Christ, you have been made for a whole different world than this. And friends, if you are not happy with what you see in the mirror today. And you're hearing this and you're like, you know what, I'm very much at home in this world. I urge you now to take a look to Jesus. To look to Him and see Him dying on that cross for you. <coughs> to hear His words that all who come to Him, whosoever believes in Him, shall be saved. That whosoever is for you. And that mirror that you're looking in today that shows so much ugliness, can be turned right around by God to show you so much beauty through Jesus and by no other way. And dear brother and sister Christian, I think all of us need to look in that mirror today and we need to untach ourselves from this world quite a bit more than we have. And we need to look to Him and understand that that's where we are going. This is what He is making us to be. And we ought to let that knowledge transform us to live more for Him today. As our musicians come, let's pray. Father, as we bow before you, I thank you that you give us this look by which we see what you, Lord, are making us to be and the heaven to which you are bringing us into. And when I think, Lord, of the eternal bliss and felicity and glory that is before us, I see, Father, how, how truly damaged this world and this life is. I thank you for your grace that saved me and saved all my brothers and sisters here at Lord, I pray if there's any here today that need that hope, I pray, Lord, you would bring them to yourself now that they would put their faith in Jesus and follow you. Open their hearts, Lord, and make them beautiful, I pray. In Jesus' name.